I would like to thank uh, the friends of the National World War II Memorial for inviting me to participate uh, with this presentation on my father's memoir uh, on a book entitled A View from the Mine Sweepers Bridge. My name is Rodney Goodwin, and I'm the youngest son of late Commander Richard John Grove Goodwin, and who was the author of this memoir. And I'm sharing with you a glimpse uh, into the life of a British Royal Naval officer who served gallantry in World War II. And I do so as a son, and that is my perspective. And of course, I'm not a historian. I'm doing this more as an adventure, which has unfolded for the whole family as a result of what my father was doing when he was in his late years pecking away at a computer on things that we didn't even know exactly what he was doing. The reality is that there are fewer and fewer living military voices today uh, that are being discovered. There are few written accounts of World War II uh, that um, make valuable narr first-hand narratives uh, of the bravery and dedication of who served. This is a first-hand narrative. In the latter years of his life, my father recounted his experiences in the war, intending it only to be a family keepsake. At around the age of 90, as I said, he was living perhaps then in Naples, Florida. My mother had passed away. And after her death, he was spending time writing. We really didn't know what he was doing, but he would call us every now and again and let us know that he had questions about how to maneuver and work his computer. It was not until perhaps uh, uh, five years later, and this was in Ottawa, Canada, at a family reunion, that he presented my brother Clive, my sister Sylvia, and myself with a single 160 spaced pages uh, of, with, interspersed with pictures and letters and maps of his life and he entitled it, This Is My Memoir. To be fair, we didn't pay a lot of attention. We said, wow, dad, that's great. And we were all having very hectic lives at the time. We were raising our children. We were in the middle of our careers. And so what we all did in our own respective ways was to set, relegate that particular memoir, as he called it, to the shelf. On July the 28th of 2012, at the age of 99, our father passed away in Lima, Peru. That's a story in itself as to why Lima, Peru. It wasn't until five years later that I picked up the memoir off the shelf and started to read it. And my wife and I both started to look at this more carefully. And we realized that this was indeed an extraordinary treasure. And so, that is where this whole adventure began uh, that is now turned into a book, as I said, entitled A View from the Minesweepers Bridge. My brother, sister, and I, we saw it as a tribute to our father, but also to those whose legacy of service and achievement played out against pivotal events of the 20th century. He was born in Persia in 1913, now Iran, of course, and his father was assigned to Persia, to Iran, as a member of the Imperial Bank uh, of the UK to serve as a branch manager for the branch of the Imperial Bank in Kazvin, Persia, and also was the British consul. It was then my father and my mother, they were married, and uh, a typical picture of that era of, of a wedding there's a picture, of course, of my father and his sister, Kathleen, his elder sister, dressed in uh, local outfits as children. Very austere, uh, very distant is the way it felt, even when we saw these pictures ourselves as children. I saw for the first time as this memoir, as I read it more carefully, the thoughtfulness, the passion, the humor, 
the compassion, the heroism, uh, but also the vulnerability of my father, um, which I had never seen uh, when he was my father living and right next to us. I realized that the memoir, which he handed us, was very poorly compiled and full of typos, which it was which pretty normal to be that way. Uh, and but I realized, too, that it needed a lot of work. And so we began to do all we could to take that manuscript and put it into a, a document that could be used perhaps for a book, a document that others would like to read as well. I was gaining insight into an understanding of my father on a level I had not previously experienced. My father had had little help from his parents in Persia. Parents were very austere, very distant. He had to find his own way in a very troubled world in which he found himself. He needed a mentor. And he was thrown into boarding schools and uh, which were not particularly good for him. And he had to figure things out for himself. It is here where I, uh, I mean, I saw him as a son, I saw him as a dashing, tall, good-looking man. Uh, he was a loving father, had a great sense of humor. He was interested in everything. He spoke several languages. Uh, he just about everywhere around the world. Uh, he could talk about that with great detail, enthusiasm, and interest. But it was fair to say that I never really knew who he was deep down inside. He very rarely spoke of his world, of his war experiences. Um, he only shared snippets about the war and he was never one to boast um, and kept a lot of personal feelings deep down to himself. He rarely showed deep emotional, uh, deep emotions. And some of that was due to his austere upbringing in what I would call post Victorian England. I think as, as an aside, it is uh, interesting to note that many soldiers, sailors and airmen who served during World War II and subsequent wars uh, speak very sparingly about their experiences. Uh, and that was definitely the case that I experienced with my father. You will see now a slide of my father uh, as a cadet serving on HMS Conway and HMS Conway is where he began his seafaring training at the age of 17 for the Naval, Royal Naval Reserve, a volunteer reserve of the Royal Navy, a 19th century, believe it or not, wooden ship founded in 1859. And you can look at the, and the picture that you'll see of this particular ship, you see how it's a galleon. And it's, uh, it's rigorous uh, training that would take place on that on all levels. My father graduated uh, from HMS Conway and was required to take all of his facets of, uh, of training um, and try to apply these now to the next level. In order to advance uh, in the Navy and in the Merchant Navy, one had to sit for the Board of Trade examinations. Um, which required every person, every officer, to complete two years of service uh, in the Merchant Marine. So he went to sea, and uh, the first ship that he served on was, uh, was the Pacific Steamship Navigation Company, who had a vessel uh, which they owned called the SS or MV Laguna. It was a modern freighter. Um, and he boarded that uh, from the port of Hull in Yorkshire. And it was a freighter that was one of the newest of that particular fleet that they had. And off he went, sailing uh, to many different places, but particularly to South America. You will see then that uh, there's a, quite a change in his next uh, assignment. He went on to the Pacific Steamship Navigation Company's premier ship. It was called the Reina del Pacifico. It was a 400 passengers, most luxurious liner that was trading to South America, most powerful, uh, fastest, sailing at 18 knots. There were all kinds of interesting things that happened on that ship, none the least of which, uh, 
apart from the training, and my father commented that he got just extraordinary amount of exposure on that ship serving as a cadet. And um, there were references to sort of new nautical pieces of equipment. One of them was a Cherny, a Cherny Keep log, which is a system that a ship of this, I guess it was being modern, uh, was able to track speed and distance, something which we take for granted today on, on everything. Um, but that was a new gizmo and it was all mechanical and it had to be extended out into the water and then retracted. But the stories about how that became a problem and it created a leak and how he had to, as a cadet, try to fix this with other, other cadets on the ship. But that was part of the training. And the other part was that as a passenger ship, he was able to have some association with the, with the passengers. One passenger turned out to be his future wife, Joan. And there's a slide of Joan here, which uh, Joan was going between the UK and in this case, going back to Chile, where she lived with her family. And that's when he met her. He served um, on eight ships. Um, and uh, there was the Lautaro, there was the Orbiter. At that particular time, uh, you will see my father getting engaged um, to Joan there in Chile. And uh, the PSNC were pretty satisfied with all of his work and what he had been achieving. And as he finished, he went to another ship called the Losada. And it was on the Losada that he waited to receive word about what his next assignment would be. There's a slide of the commendations that he got from PSNC. And as war became imminent, he waited instructions to begin his Royal Naval Reserve training. And you couldn't really do that unless you served on a military vessel, uh, in this case, a naval vessel. Um, and he went to serve on the HMS Drake for gunnery courses, which he had to do. And that was his next assignment. And now we're, we're talking about December 31st, 1939. And uh, you will see that uh, my, my mother, who was living in Chile, um, decided that it was time for her to go across the Atlantic to marry my father. Um, they both, uh, there's a lot in the book about the decisions, the letters that they wrote to each other as she decided that she would venture out from Chile in these very troubled waters, very dangerous waters. And there's a slide of her crossing uh, on the SS Samaria on her way to England. That was a very daring thing to do with convoys uh, all being protected, as you know, by submarines, as happened so much at that particular time. But these were one of the first ventures of these convoys starting out across the Atlantic, and so many ran into trouble. Now you see a slide of his being married in Chalfont St. Giles in Buckinghamshire in England. That was on February the 24th, 1940. And this was happening right alongside of his next most serious and most significant assignment. And I think this is where everything becomes very interesting and certainly was for all of us in the family reading his memoir. He was appointed to a ship called the HMS Board, docked on the Medway River, January the 8th, 1940. And that's where his duties began. And it was all happening at the same time as he was having his wedding, <laughs> marrying, finding a place to live with his new bride. Uh, all the worries about living in London at the time were part of the book as well and part of his memoirs. And they, they had to be very thoughtful about how they would survive through the Blitzkrieg in London. And they spent 59 days uh, experiencing the bombings and navigating the streets of London uh, to get back and forth, in this his case, from the ship where he was, which was docked there um, on the Medway. Uh, because the assignment on HMS board uh, began a little later. It wasn't, uh, they, they were married in February, and now we're talking May before he was able to start his particular uh, work on the, on the board. What was interesting about the board is that this was 
um, an experimental vessel. It was um, an experimental magnetic mine detecting vessel. And there is a snippet here where Winston Churchill is talking about the issues that were facing England at the time. Too many ships were being blown up by mines laid by the Nazis. And they had not yet, prior to this time, discovered a way to find the mines and detonate them in a way to get them out of the way of the vessels, get them away out of the ships. And he refers to this in this particular snippet. Um, he said, everything was very quiet here. This is Winston Churchill. And he's writing, I assume, to Parliament. Uh, I'd like to know that we have had a marked success against the magnetic mines. Um, the first two devices for setting them off, which we have gotten into action, um, have both proven effective. And so this was a reference to what my father was now doing on HMS board. Uh, this um, is top secret experimental magnetic demining ship, HMS board, was to counter the devastating loss of supply ships uh, around Britain. And there was, it was a tremendous loss that they were experiencing. In this particular um, part of the book, my father says that the, the tidal river Thames, uh, and I'm just reading now his words, he said, played an important role during World War II, of which my, he was keenly aware of. And he said, as you know, the Nazis were busy laying magnetic mines by submarines at the mouth of the Thames. It was due to the extreme low tides that the Royal Navy found German, the first of a kind magnetic mines in the mud and were able to examine, diffuse and study them. And he goes on to say that this was a little known turning point in the war for, the, for England. On the HMS board, they had placed on this 2000 ton vessel, uh, they'd fitted her with a 400 ton electromagnetic magnet, if you believe that a type of magnet in which the magnetic field that it produces um, would send out an electric current. I'm not an expert at all in magnetic mines or in this field. It's quite detailed in the, in the book. But this was about an eight feet in diameter uh, magnet, magnet um, supplied with considerable electric current. And it was calculated that if uh, the magnet is on the ship and turned on, uh, it will it can detonate a magnetic mine about 150 yards ahead of the ship. Uh, there is so much that one could say about this, but um, the, the bottom line of it is, is that this particular experimental vessel was sent out into the River Thames, into the estuary. My father was a navigator on this particular ship they did have had no idea whether it would work and of course the decks were covered in mattresses so that the if indeed there were an ex, there was to be an explosion uh, the the all the, the sailors wouldn't have their legs broken because the ship would literally be lifted out of the water the hms board had been described in some reports as a mine detector vessel um, uh, it, it, I suppose um, uh, the Admiralty had devised it to be that. And uh, it was clear that the expedition was one of ex pretty much desperation. My father says in the book, he said, there was a tug following them behind while they were going out on this expedition. And somebody asked, he asked, what are they following? Why are they following us? He said, well, those, those are been told their big responsibility is to pick up any, any, the, any who who, any who bodies that are floating in the water, <laughs> um, which shows you how this was being handled. Um, the success of this was very important. They had an experience when this ship sent out a detection into the minefield and uh, almost the front of the ship was lifted out of the water. Uh, it was extraordinary in many ways. The ship was damaged, but they proved again that this mine detection system that had been devised with this huge magnet was successful.
Now, my father, there's a slide that comes up um, which shows uh, commendations um, from his captain of, uh, of the board, this is Roland Hudson, who was a um, commander who my father admired greatly. He talks a lot about that. He was assigned now to the HMS Whitehaven, and the HMS Whitehaven uh, was a, a Bangor-class minesweeper, um, and it was on this particular ship that he performed the longest minesweeping of the war throughout the Mediterranean. And uh, there's a slide of a commendation as well that is shown of his service on this particular ship. And um, the Whitehaven, um, uh, which was named after the town of Cumbria in, uh, in England. The thing that is so amazing is that this particular activity was taking place in between the, the personal life. And you'll see a slide now um, where my father's holding my brother, Clive, uh, now in October 1941. This particular event of uh, all the work that was gone on, uh, had gone on on the HMS Whitehaven, was noted, and my father was uh, was then awarded the Distinguished Service Cross um, for great skill, endurance, and devotion in to duty in clearing the enemy minefields to enable supply convoys and the bombardment of forces to operate in support of the English Army in their advance. From, England, from Egypt to Tunis. This particular timing falls into line with the, the movie entitled Operation Mincemeat, which uh, came out recently. And it was a Second World War plan um, uh, for an Operation Mincemeat, a deception uh, effort to keep the Allied invasion of Sicily hidden. And it was just happened that the HMS Whitehaven was asked to go into the area of, of Sicily and be clearing that particular beach area and the, the waters around that area to allow the forces to disembark, not encountering many uh, much much uh, enemy fire. Um, but this was all because it was part of that deception program that is talked about in the movie. Operation Mincemeat, uh, because this is a way of diverting the attention of the Germans who thought that uh, the landing was going to be, in this case, um, in another location. On June the 6th, uh, 1944, my father um, now was back in the UK, and uh, he was going to be participating in the in the whole events of D-Day and the invasion of Normandy and was very much in involved with the Mulberry Harbor and planned, um, which is planned on the basis of an invasion, as you know, on June the 5th. And he writes about this. He says, the Mulberry Harbor is planned on the basis of an invasion on June the 5th involved the use of old merchant vessels traveling under their own engines to the Gold Beach, which is where he was going to land, and then being carefully sunk by opening sea valves in places to form a breakwater. Many of these old vessels had to be moved from ports in Scotland and Northern England to ports nearer the invasion coast. This made it necessary for them to start on their journeys two or three days before D-Day planned. And he said, we left Southampton on the evening of June the 5th in a landing craft known as an LCIL with the senior officers of a Canadian battalion and a full load of infantry men and their equipment. He says, behind us followed six more LCILs, fully loaded. It was a pitch black night, but with good visibility. Our course was to take us out from Southampton waters, past the western end of the Isle of Wight and out to the English Channel and across to the French coast. As we approached the Calshot light buoy, I was surprised to see ahead of us the silhouette of a vessel against the lighter eastern sky. Then further ahead, another such silhouette. This was not in accordance with what I had expected, he says. No ship should be coming into the Southampton water on this night. And then I realized suddenly that this was one of the problems that we had to expect because this invasion was one day later than planned and the ships coming in were old ships from the Mulberry Harbors that were moving to a port nearer than the ports in Scotland from which they had left as a schedule for an invasion day, D-Day of June the 5th. 
I knew that there was nothing that I could do, but I was very worried, he says, about the LCIL astern of us. I was going to pass the incoming ships in a relatively wide part of the channel, but the LCILs would have to pass them in a narrow place, which I had already passed. I had visions of possibly collision, of possible collisions, and I felt helpless to do anything about it. It was exactly at 7 a.m. on June the 6th that we were off of Gold Beach, and the skipper of the LCIL prepared to beach this craft. Large warships were standing off the coast, firing at the German coastal batteries, and smaller vessels, such as destroyers, were patrolling to locate possible submarines. German shells were visible landing in the water astern of us as we approached the beach, and once the troops were ashore, it was our turn. He was with Captain Dolphin, and Captain Dolphin said he was ready. He said, we jumped together. So that was my father's narrative, a brief one of what happened on D-Day for him. He was, he got onto the beaches, he was injured and uh, had to be evacuated uh, later back to the hospital in England. But within 10 days, he was sent back, uh, now appointed as ad assistant admiralty birthing officer for Mulberry Harbor B, which is a designation given to that particular part of the Mulberry Harbor. Radical shift right now in everything that took place in my father's life uh, related to the, to the Royal Navy. And he was then a call back by the Admiralty after D-Day and was asked um, that if he would, because of his exposure to Latin America and his um, fluency in Spanish, if he would now travel on behalf of the Admiralty uh, throughout Central and South America uh, to speak about the Royal Navy's World War II efforts. This opened a whole new chapter for my father, and in fact, for the whole family, um, which would last another 40 years. It was an um, assignment uh, that obviously had him meeting a lot of people, and we understand that while he was on that particular trip, and you'll see some pictures of him here, uh, meeting with journalists uh, as he traveled, throughout uh, South America, a layout now of Peru, because that was where he had been offered an assignment uh, to join, and this now, we're in the peacetime, the, the company called Lobitas Oil. Lobitas Oil is on this map, which one can find, is in the northern part of Peru, in the oil fields of that particular country. And so my father took on this assignment um, more as the marine superintendent for this particular oil company. And it launched uh, a whole life for the family because um, we now, you're, you're starting to see um, the family is in Peru. Um, in this particular case, um, he, we were in the town of Salaberry. Um, then we were in Lima. And he, my father, was then taking on an assignment with W.R. Grace, a Grace Line out of New York, and uh, then with Likes Lines out of New Orleans uh, to be their, their representative throughout the West Coast of South America. You will see a slide here which brings us to times when my father was in Lima uh, now, and you can see him being acknowledged by the Duke of Edinburgh um, uh, at a particular gathering there. We children, we were living in Peru, we were living in Salaberry. As we come to the close of my father's life, it was now, uh, I think, um, an experience for all of us uh, that, we were, that is indelible. Uh, I grew up um, the first seven years of my life in Peru. I was born in England, and I was pretty much a, a, a Peruvian <laughs> in that I grew up there in these little villages uh, speaking mostly Spanish. And uh, we then were sent off to boarding school in England. And that's a whole nother chapter and the world that I uh, have come from. Summary of the book in a recent review by Jackson Van Uden, who recently said, the story in a, is an easy to read and about this book, accessible style that draws readers in and makes them want to learn more about Goodwin and his life. This writing style made me not want to put the book down as I continued reading it late into the night and early hours of the morning. I also felt personally connected to Goodwin's story as Goodwin lived in and frequented areas of England that I am familiar with 
I could picture him walking the very same streets that I have. I finished this book with a real sense of who Commander Richard J.G. Goodwin was, which is a clear hallmark of a fantastic memoir. Nice review to have received uh, for this particular effort of putting a memoir that literally came off all kinds of little pages and notes from my father. And suddenly the, the medals uh, that my father had given us in a tattered box at the end of his life took on a much more pro profound meaning. Uh, but he received the Dis Distinguished Service Cross, which is the, uh, a very significant medal for his performance and his gallantry and heroism during the war. And I will just finish by saying that um, my father uh, looked at his life uh, very modestly. Um, he says, I, and he writes this in the book, I said, I think I'm pretty close to the end of my act on this stage. And I dedicate these few lines, not to an audience, but my fellow actors, my family. My family who have accompanied me so lovingly to this point, only they will find anything of interest in what I have written. Well, it turned out that we, there's probably a lot more that others would like to know and found interesting too. He said, the person who started the life, the life is a game theory, went on to say that it does not really matter who wins or who loses because the most important thing is how the game is played. My consciousness again said that I did not have to worry because my failures had all been forgiven and there were signs I had played the game well. I leave you, he says, with some unsolicited testimonials, this is part of the memoir, as to how I have been judged by others and who have accompanied me to the less pleasant stages of a game of life I wonder if there's any life lived without some regrets. I hope I may have be forgiven for presenting these testimonials with a little pride and uh, to compensate for those regrets. Um, somehow we believe that, that uh, more than just the family will find the story of interest and encouragement and inspiration. The last part of my father's life was when they were living in Naples, Florida. And there's a slide of him as the, the court interpreter for the courts of Naples. And he is being awarded a plaque at the age of 79. I think that nobody in the court in Naples knew that he was that age, um, but he served there for quite a few years. And it was an amazing experience for them. And a picture of us as a family at that time uh, in, in Florida, and uh, these last few words, which in a sense um, taken up with that picture of where he was cremated in Peru, and ultimately his ashes were on that wall that you see there. I thank you very much for taking time to listen to what I'm sharing with you, uh, not as an expert in this field, as a son listening and reading and watching much of what my father had, uh, had shared. And we were so pleased that we were able to put this into a book. And should you have any other questions that you would like to ask, I look forward to trying to answer those to the best of my ability.